And scene. Now we're going. <laughs> what is happening, everybody? How you doing? Very important. Never forget to unmute. You know, there's a lot of important things. You know, turn something on, plug it in the right place, <laughs> unmute when you want to hear it. You know, little things that make such a yeah, big difference. Yeah, plugging into the right place is one of the most important things. I mean, I that's not a mistake I make. <laughs> nah. <laughs> I do that all the time. Okay, so we're doing a little different today. Our scheduling recently has been kind of a nightmare, but a nightmare in a very good way. Uh, there's just a lot going on, and it's been moving around, but we wanted to get another console side chat in as soon as possible. Ernesto is going to be out of town for a bit. We wanted to do it before he left. So we're doing it on Sunday afternoon, right before we have a session for song number three of the Songs from the Studio series. So, <laughs> so yeah. we're setting up both things at the same time right now so we wanted to see how much time crunch we can achieve you know so since we're doing it anyway right so let's just put two things on top of each other let's see how much panic we can create yes so pretty good i mean we got two minutes in right alex says he only sounds good when he's muted <laughs> that's I, you know what i have a feeling it's the same thing with me but i think it's sure. other people saying it about me 
We're also trying out a little different. We've got the MK47s up today. Just trying out just a little bit different setup since we're not doing headphones. And I know with me, my talking, I get a lot of plosives. So hopefully the audio is nice and smooth today. Yeah. We look like more pro now because it's like they're condensers, right? Same. We sound more pro when we talk yeah. about it. We're like podcasters now. <laughs> That's the thing now, right? Everybody has to be yep. podcasting. So we in, in a little bit, we're going to have a little, uh, little surprise from this upcoming episode of Songs from the Studio. Because we're partially set up, so I'm gonna we're just gonna show you one thing. We're not we're not completely dialed in on sounds, but we're gonna we're just gonna what what would you say premiere? Yeah, not, not really premiere. Tease. The, yeah, a little yeah, a little small preview of what's gonna happen later. A little bit, yeah. We'll yeah. do that in just a little bit. Mm hmm. But uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Alex. So okay. I'm gonna I want to start off with this. There was a great question and kind of conversation yesterday, uh, Wade actually posted on the Facebook group uh, about some overhead choices, some the, the mics that he had. I'll pull that up in a minute because I don't remember exactly. I think it was the Studio Project B1, if I'm not mistaken. We were talking about small diaphragm condensers. The, he was the SM81s versus large diaphragms because he was also looking at the MK47. And I think there was a, was it a SE or a Lewitt in there as well? Just some different options. And that... Uh, is actually a really it, kind of an interesting topic, at least for me. Maybe it's just because I like recording drums. But the difference in large diaphragm versus small diaphragm. And everybody has their preferences, you know. And we could also say that the music, you know, the music will tell you what to use. And that's great. If you have enough mics to choose from, you can do all sorts of different things. But I just, for me, there's a couple general, and I'm going to say general because every mic's a little bit different. But there are some general differences between the, the two microphones that I've noticed uh, from recording a lot with both. Although I haven't used small diaphragms as overheads in a long time because I personally gravitate towards uh, some sort of large diaphragm for everything, uh, which is where the Mini K47 gets to be a little bit unique because it kind of acts like a small diaphragm, but that in a second. But one of the biggest differences that I've noticed is small diaphragms get have real they're usually a little faster the transient response is really nice they're snappy they're articulate uh they can be a little noisy sometimes but if you're doing loud music it doesn't matter and when mm -hmm. i say a little noisy i'm being like like <laughs> yeah if you're recording something you can be really quiet you know all modern mics are mics are great and have pretty low uh, self noise but the, usually the small diaphragm you'll get that nice transient response you know a lot that People like cymbals with them. You know, s snares can be sharp. Toms can have a nice attack to them. Whereas in general, large diaphragm will tend to smooth it out just a little bit, but also have a little bit more body in general. So you might get a little bit more of the, the depth of the drums from a large diaphragm, and you might get a little bit more of the attack or the sharpness of the drums from a uh, small diaphragm condenser. And I would say the same thing on an acoustic guitar. I think we've both noticed that mm -hmm. sometimes we've chosen a small diaphragm over a large diaphragm because we want it to be a bit more percussive, Yeah, you know, or we wanted it to be a little rounder and smoother or we needed some body. So, okay, let's throw up a large diaphragm. Sometimes both, but I, I've kind of stopped recording multiple mics on acoustic guitars. Find a mic that works and go. But those are two main kind of differences. I mean, there's more obviously, but when we're talking drums and you're trying to think of what type of sound you want or how you want to capture it. I think I like gravitate towards the large diaphragm more because to me, regardless of style, I still like to look at my overheads as a, as a snapshot of the entire kit. And I do the same thing with, you know, metal, hard rock, whatever. You know, if you saw the thing with Kin, we kind of approach it that way too. Uh, some Blood Feast ritual stuff that's getting ready to come out and Michael Ball is working on a whole solo thing. We just tracked... Well, just uh, right at the end of last year, we did like 15 songs with his drummer, Joey. Seven days of this crazy stuff. And I used a pair of uh, 87, MK87s on that because we were going for a smoother thing. And they sounded great. So I don't think you can pigeonhole a, a mic to a per particular genre, per se. Uh, but some lean one way or the other, depending on what type of sound you're trying to get. For instance, a metal thing with blah, 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 fast. Maybe you want that articulation. I think... And I think that's one reason why a lot of engineers, producers gravitate towards small diaphragms for that kind of music because they are very articulate. Mm -hmm. 
but enter this MK47. And I'm not being paid for this, by the way. Matter of fact, I almost, I don't know if I've told this story, but I almost ruined my chances of ever working with Matt the first time I met him. <laughs> I'll tell that in a minute. Uh, but there's something interesting about this particular mic is, yes, it's a large diaphragm condenser, but it, with the way it handles transients, it has the characteristics of a small diaphragm condenser. It's very, very articulate, but it has a little bit of body. You know, for drums, the, the pattern's a little bit tighter, which can be nice on overheads because it mitigates a little bit of room noise, so you can, or sound, room sound, I should say. So if you have room mics, you can really kind of differentiate your sounds. If you're in a room that's smaller or problematic, that also helps. But it's kind of, I've found this mic to be a bit of the best of both worlds. You can get a little bit of that body, and you can get that nice transient response all at the same time. And if I can have my cake and eat it too, I'm gonna. Marcos is asking, uh, did we use the 251 in, in Omni or was it cardioid when we did the one, everything on one mic? Because we just used one overhead, right? Yeah, there was no room on that. Uh -oh, so was, have you ever used a mono Omni dynamic? Oh, di an Omni dynamic? No. I mean, I've never used an Omni dynamic. I'm trying to, yeah, no. I'm trying to think of. I have used a mono Omni condenser because that can be really cool. And the cool thing about Omni is it's usually it's got a bit more bottom end than cardioid. It picks up a more fuller, but it's also smoother on the highs just because of the, the, the polar pattern. And that can be great on cymbals, so you can actually get it a little bit down lower so you don't get too roomy, but you get the whole kit. That's actually that's actually a cool sound. We should that's gotta go on the list of one of our, mm. our parameters coming up for one of these uh, songs from the studio oh and i'm going to do a bunch of experimenting i'm getting ready to start another new series that's going to be based around music but it's going to come from a very different direction than the songs from the studio and i'm going to experiment more especially on the drum side and the reamping side of things it's really an excuse for me to get uh creative <laughs> and i'm just going to film it so <laughs> I hope, cross my fingers hope it comes out good but a mono over or uh, sorry a mono omni overhead can be really cool actually that's on the list. But I a, dyna a mono dynamic. I'm sorry, an omni dynamic. I know there is one, but I, off the top of my head, I can't think of what that is. Marcos, do you know uh, a model number or, or type make uh, manufacture on that? I'd like to look that up. And Dave is asking T25 compared to the Mini K4787. The T25. I don't think I've used that one. I have the S25. Wait, which one did I build when, when I was sweating bullets soldering that mic Wasn't on? Wasn't that the T25? I think it was. Yeah. It was a cool mic. We used it on a couple of things. That actually, that T25, you know, that'd be a nice little comparison because I, I, it's been a while since I've used that mic. One thing I remember about it initially right out of the gates, we put it on Ernesto's acoustic guitar, that 25, that T25. It's one of the best acoustic guitar sounds we got with that guitar. It was mm -hmm. insane how natural and woody it sounded. Yeah. It was crazy. So I would say just based on what I just said, and that's about all I can remember because that was a while ago, it's probably kind of in the ballpark of the 87 as far as it's being a bit more natural. You know what? we got to write that down and add that to the list because that's mm -hmm. that would be a good one. And then we had that great experiment with the uh, – uh, T25 room sound where we cranked everything. And oh, see, yeah. now you're going to see this is another one of those things that I made a mistake. I never said that. No, no. I mean, nobody talks about a mistake. It <laughs> that was, was an my expand. arrested development moment. Yeah. I've made a huge mistake. I've never said that. Uh, <laughs> we ended that live broadcast because it took me a little bit longer to solder. And I was quite frankly, I was sweating bullets with everybody watching me. When we went to do the test, when I finally put the last thing together right after the broadcast <laughs> ended, Put it in front of the drums and went, pull it up. And it's like, wow, man, this mic is it's it's really, roo it's roomy. roomy. It's roomy. <laughs> wow, this is a polar pattern on this thing. Like Matt said it was cardioid, but it's seeming to be <laughs> really wide. And we move it closer to the drums. Well, that's a little less roomy, but, yeah. man, it's you know this is kind of weird, you I know? Mean, it's right on the on the head. Yeah. What's you know, on? I mean, it's like, you know, I'm playing the drums, and the mic's, like, right here, and it still sounds like it's out in the middle of the room. And I'm like, man, I'm like, wait a second. Let me take a look at something. I wired the capsule on backwards. 
That was so. We have it in front of the drums that Caps has pointed out <laughs> into the room. What a all moment! Time. What a moment! I really wish that would have happened live because I, I I'd laugh at that one because I was worried about making that mistake a mistake that like was, that. That was and awesome. I made it. That was awesome. I mean, it's the same the same uh, example of when singers just sing in the to the wrong side of the mic. It's, man, this mic sucks. It's not working. You know? That's it's happened like, with the Heil, yeah. the PR30, a bunch yeah. of times. You put it up, and it's an in-fire, and I've seen people like lift it up and sing into the side <laughs> of it. It's like, no, it even says on the end of the mic that it's an in-fire mic. <laughs> yeah, and in certain brands, uh, condensers, sometimes the where you have all the switches is the front, and sometimes it's not because the logo is on the other side. And so, so sometimes you really have to... Oh, man, I've done that with an overhead before. You have to really pay attention. It's like, where's the front on, on, on these mics? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not rocket science, but you do have to pay attention. But that T25, that that was a cool mic. That'd be a... Dave, that's a cool... Uh, would be a kind of a fun comparison just to know, you know. Sure, as SM63. Son of bitch. Let's look that son up of, right now. Son of B. Sure SM60. Trace. Wow. There you go. It's not even an expensive mic. Wow. Omni Omni Dynamic. That is crazy. That's great. That could be cool, actually. <laughs> Dave goes, all your talks with Matt sold me. I built a pair of S3... 87s they're bonkers which one where's that it's dave oh nice yeah man matt just makes really good stuff i mean whether it's the mic parts or the roswell it's it's well thought out it's well built uh, he does a really nice job with that the sm83 that is i'm putting that in the save list because that is that's intriguing I love it. I've already there's already three new ideas, and we're uh -huh. like ten minutes into the stream. This is fantastic. I love it. Can I put a piece of paper? See, out? Yeah, I was just reading that around on Spitu Sank. Can't you make it into an Omni? I don't know. What's 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 the thinking on that? I'm not sure. Oh, Electro Ooh, Voice hold on. 63. A Pulling that one up too. EV 635A 5A. Oh, oh, this mic I've actually seen before. Man, none of these are that expensive either. Okay. This is going in the list as well. We're gonna have some dynamic stuff coming up. Oh yeah, because that's that's what we uh, that was one of the parameters, right? Just all dynamics. Yeah, that is one that we want to do where there is no condensers on anything, yeah. overheads, mm -hmm. uh, room mics, whatever. So okay, well, good. There's two. There's two good ones. Yeah, the EV. The, man, these are not that expensive. I imagine the EV. You know what? I actually have a pair of Audio Technicas that are similar to this EV. The model is escaping me at the moment. But a lot of the times, because looking at this EV, these are mics that got used in uh, interviews. Mm. When you, you know, or even, you know, you look at, you know, the talk shows and those old, and they, they do the mic back more. Those are almost always omni microphones. Yeah, let's share that here. You're on three. Cut me in. You're on three. Yeah, I'm three. So there's the EV. And the audio, matter of fact, I'll go grab the. I'm That's trying to remember cool. where I put those Audio Technicas. Oh, I know where I use those. Okay, and here's the Shure that they were talking about. Oh, pull that up. This is the Shure SM63. Looks cool. Now, the Audio Technica one, I've actually used as... See, now I'm remembering all this stuff. Uh, I In the front of the... The kit before, if you go, there's a video I did, I think, last year with Mike Neeland. I think we call it Getting Big Drum Sounds with Mike Neeland or something. He had this that huge, like, Rush-style kit. And we used the Audio Technica. Man, I cannot remember the uh, the model number. I'll go, I'll go find it in a minute. Uh, in front of the kit, like the kit front mic. And I also put one over on, I mic'd one of the panels on the wall or something, and we just crushed it with compression, and it was actually pretty cool. 
I completely forgot I had those mics. Alex says, use it as a front of kit mic in a test. Oh, that was, yes. There's two videos I used it in. There was the front kit mic one. I, I remember that now because I think I did a 57. I did the 12 gauge mic. I did the Roswells. I, uh, I used that Audio Technica and a few others. But there's also the, the one with Mike Nealon that we used it. And it was actually really cool. Good. So I have, you know, I'm just going to look that one up right now, too. Yeah. And then Wade says, Wilkinson Audio makes a plastic piece to wrap around a 57. Okay. I'm Here, let me, one mic at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Alex goes, they're Omni because people on the street don't know how to talk into a mic. Well, yep. that's very true. Very and true. it also helps. They're more forgiving with uh, mm -hmm. volume. Totally. You don't get the proximity effect, so you have, you know, you put it up to somebody and they're, ah! which, you know, somebody like me. Come mm. on, you know, let's go. Wow. Yeah, man, Marcos, I mean, he's just throwing out all these mic models. Wil Holy crap, Aroni. Wilkinson. Audio. Let's see if this is the same. They make those clips, too. I bought one of the X clips. It's not from it's not from Wilkinson though. I bought a different one. Oh no, it was. Yeah, the uh the S the they have the SM57 to S SDC clip. That's what I use when I use two mics all the time. And then Oh, the Omni Ring. Okay. This is interesting. Here, cut me in again. There, that's what he's talking about. Wow, look at that. Yep. That is very cool. Dang. All right, that's going on the list. Here, there's here's what I use when I run two mics. When I run the SDC84 and, a, and the Unidime, oh, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I'm using. I'm not sure I bought I thought there was another company, like X-Clip or something, that I got mm. it from. But they work really well. Work really well. All right, another mic you have to look up. Uh, Sennheiser MD21. He's sharing all his secret weapons. <laughs> <laughs> MD MD21. Oh, that's cool. Is that like interesting? And we got all sorts of fun mics. Nope, that's not the website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, it's broadcast mic. Yeah. I think broad. you can have some fun with all these broadcast mics because they will definitely get you a different vibe. Okay, that's cool. I'm going to have to keep that one in mind. A lot of cool mics here. We're going to do an all dynamic thing, and we're going to play around with these omni dynamic mics for sure wow aaron says the clips to hold a pencil condenser to a 57th are 3d printable yeah but i can't afford the 3d printer well I mean, it was cheaper for me to buy <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean it's really simple stuff yeah yeah when it comes to that yeah yeah that's great Look them up on the thingiverse <laughs> <laughs> thingiverse <laughs> But I think it's cool with all these mics is to try different mics that, you know, especially when you're getting into these dynamics and use them in places that you might use a condenser or something mm -hmm. that is nicer, whatever that means. Yeah. And see what kind of sounds you can come up with. I'm back to using my 12 gauge Red 12 almost all the time out as a front kit mic now. I, I used it on a session. Okay. I got to say this. Yesterday I had one of the best sessions I've had in a long uh, most fun ones in a long time i had the rhythm section of earth wind and fire here Redeen was here john paris great drummer eddie m the sax player who was with prince and everybody they were here a totally fun absolutely fun group i wish i could play some music but i can't when it comes out i will definitely be sharing that because these guys groove like oh my lord it's awesome but we had john brought uh, a Kind of a large kit. It was three racks and a floor and a kit and a giant kick, like a 24. I think it was a 24, but it was deep. And it sounded great. All tuned really tight. And 
they were all out looking and at the mic they thought i just uh, hung a, an xlr cable over a mic clip <laughs> in front because those are small and i'm like no, no no it's made of a shotgun shell and they were looking at it so when i pulled it in the mix just like this much it's the bloat mic even when you don't really hear there's a mic in front yeah, of the yeah, kit yeah, if yeah, you yeah. turn it off your kit goes from like this it kind of goes Bleh. turn it back on Bleh. And it works so well for that type of thing. It just gets a lot of that, like upper low mid and and mid range that a lot of the times we kind of scoop out. But there's a lot of size in a drum set there. You can yeah, twelve. Oh, the golds. Those are the new ones. Ooh, hey. for audience mics. Hey, they're watching us from Barbados. Yay! All right. So normally we're on the middle of that. Yeah, you know that's where we're. we're I think going forward, we might try this Sunday thing a little bit more so we can do it earlier or even later so we can try to yeah. maybe vary the time slightly, but get uh, maybe get some new people or some people that aren't having to stay up all night, especially if this many cool ideas keep coming in. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. It's great. The Audioscape Classic DI. That's great. Yeah, the Audioscape stuff is cool. I've been looking at that stuff lately, too, for sure. All right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so the vocalist, <laughs> Marco says, so the vocalist wrong mic grabbing was patented as a polar bear. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, sometimes you got to let them fall. That is awesome. Yeah, the Soyuz stuff. That I've been looking at that too. There's, there's so many mics out there. Oh, it's man. ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. And now it's like the mic locker that's in, it's in the ISO booth. Actually, it's so full that I can't. We we have so many that they just mics lay on the floor now. <laughs> you know, and that's why we're trying to mix things up. And should we do? Well, yeah. Why don't we just? Uh, we're speaking of mixing things up. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is just a small taste of my phone keeps blowing up. Oh, it's art producer from yesterday. Those guys are awesome, man. Holy crap. Oh. This is just a little sneak peek at the the what's going to be the drum setup and sound for the third song from the songs at the studio. Minnow's gonna be joining us on bass. We have a friend of mine, Matt Little, who's amazing keyboard player piano player he's gonna join us so we're gonna have somebody different on that end and then i'm not gonna say anything about the vocalist yet because i've i'm still working on that i have my list in my top i'm just waiting to get a few things done and then we'll announce that but we're partially set up with the drums because the second we're done with this we have to rip this stuff down move the cameras and get set up to start shooting that uh, we did this one a little bit different this time where Ernesto and i actually kind of Laid the whole song out this time as a rough demo. And this, you'll see once it comes out, I'm not going to give too much away, but we did a whole rough demo and sent to everyone and said, this is the outline, but it's not going to sound like, I gave some ridiculous parameters, yeah. you know, to everybody. Yeah, <laughs> Just yeah, yeah. total, like, producer thinking he's too smart speak, you know. <laughs> uh, and then we're going to shock Minnow and Matt when they get here, and I think I even did this to Ernesto last night when I called him with this idea for the drum sound given the style that we're going to go after, it's going to be completely different. So we're going to see how everybody reacts to it. Mm -hmm. But we have the setup, so I'm going to go. We got the, yeah. the camera still up there? Yep. Okay, I'm going to go make sure. Yeah, I can hear you with the talk yeah. back. So I'm going to turn these monitors down, though. Mm, yeah. Or I'll just have them up there where you can mm -hmm. hear it. So, yeah, so... So he's going to go into the live room and going to go in position and So yeah, so you're going.
So yeah. So I cannot I cannot hear what he's saying because I don't have uh, speakers here, but. Okay, I don't know if anybody can hear me. I was trying to, yeah, that, I'm trying to yell in there. We had no mic set up for that. So that kit, we're going for it. It's completely wide open. I've got nothing in the kick drum, a couple pieces of tape on the toms, a Heil PR30 on the hi-hats. The, uh, the, actually, the hi-hats are 17-inch cracked crashes that I'm going to use. Uh, yeah, they're all behind. They'll catch up. Uh, what else? The overheads, the big, yes, those are SDCs. And that, I, I decided to go off yesterday's conversation because I never use small diaphragms. So we were talking about that earlier. It's like, you know what? Today we're going to set up some small diaphragms. Those are SDC 84s from Mike Parts. Because I have two of them that are for the snare and two of them that are the regular SDC 84s. All of this stuff, when song number three comes out, we'll go through all of that so we'll get to hear everything. And yeah, that's the that's a Ludwig New Sonic kit, which I I really like those kits. Toms are tuned a little bit higher this time. Kick wide open. It's gonna be a it's actually gonna be a really cool vibe. I think I already said PR thirty five on the hi hats. You know we're gonna go completely, com completely different. But I was shocked at how you know put, pulling up those SDCs on, on the overheads sound pretty cool. <laughs> and then a pair of rooms. <laughs> <laughs> so yes yeah, so wade and alex the conversation with you guys yesterday is why those sdcs are on the overheads today got to keep changing it up i mean that's one of the things with this series is i'm gonna keep for sometimes for no apparent reason we're just gonna set a parameter or use a different mic or a setup and just go what the hell happens here to create something out of it so you know yeah, the Ludwigs. I love the Ludwigs. All the classic maple. That new Sonic kit's awesome. All the snare drums. You can't really go wrong. You can't really go wrong with Ludwig. But anyway, that's just a small taste. We still got some dialing in to do. Nothing that I just played is even remotely what the song is going to be. And basically, the end of my playing, all the nonsense that I did, that's how to get fired on a gig. <laughs> that's what that was all about. That's right. Yep. Ah, okay. That's a that's a topic we haven't talked about whatsoever. Oh, the the computer stuff. Computer stuff. Well, believe it or not, we're still running a 2010. Actually, it's a 2009 flashed Mac Pro that uh, I changed the CPU on it. So originally it was an eight core, so now it's a 12 core. And the other day we updated uh, to Mojave, so he can get the latest. Uh, Logic version for Mojave because he got a session with 10.7 on it and before he was on High Sierra and 10.4 and no go with 10.7 so it's the distance between versions is way too big and 10.5.1 which is the highest you can go on Mojave can open 10.7 I was amazed it's like oh my god that's two versions up which is pretty big and um, so yeah, it has a 500 gig SSD from Max Sales, OWC. I mean, we get a lot of stuff from them. Yep. Actually, I think. And I RAM, I think it's 24 gigs. Let's see if I can uh, the cool thing about when you when you flash this this Mac Pro, the RAM speed goes from 1066 megahertz to 1333. So there was. Changing the CPU, which is amazing. That's probably these are the, probably one of the best Mac Pros in terms of longevity ever. 
uh because i mean it's running 12 years now so yeah um, and it's loaded i mean every we have four hard drives i think we have five in there did we or did we do that in the other one where we actually took the dvd bay out yeah, and put it in an ssd actually there's two dvd bays so we took one of them and put the system drive in it and then there's four five terabyte drives in it so you got 20 terabytes of uh uh, spinning drives, right? No SSDs for audio. There's, there's no point. Uh, but we definitely need it for the, for the video. For yeah. video, you need SSD. There's no way around it. That's a whole other rig that's over there, and that's a 2000. Is that a 2019? 2019. IMAC? Yeah, 27 inch iMac. Yeah. And, um, and we had to change the graphics card on the Mac Pro be uh, to a four gigabyte Nvidia, also flashed for the Mac. So that he can uh, run the uh, Mojave, and so it would install basically. Otherwise, it, w it wouldn't let you. And uh, yeah, I so. had two sessions in a week. Actually, came in that were ten seven. Yeah. You know, one was mixing for a good friend of mine, Sammy Watson, who used to be in a band, the drummer for uh, so, Apex Apex Theory, right? Yeah. Yeah. So awesome, yeah, so man. we'll we'll see if if Apple comes out with you know ten eight, ten nine, or Logic eleven, whatever. Then yeah, anybody with the the latest logic is cannot open this anymore. So you know you have to think about upgrading. If a lot of people have the latest logic, you know, so it's in the horizon. So you know, at some point. So thank God for the new Mac Studio. You know, it looks looks good now to finally go M1 and have enough ports in the back and enough power. So yeah, that looks um, looks uh, appealing. Looks appealing. Uh, are you STFX or are you all outboard? Mainly outboard. I mean, you have just a couple of plugins, right? But mainly it's just if you use plugins, it's mainly the logic ones, right? And the then, logic plugins are really freaking good. Yeah. To be honest with you, I do use some others. You know, I have a ton of plugins that I almost never go through. I I attempt to do most of my stuff outboard as possible like at the tracking stage you know because it's one it's fun and that's really important but also it sounds good and it gets the sounds i'm looking for and then i will manipulate further obviously you know it is a definitely a hybrid setup but i i go to logic plugins a ton there's a few waves that i use and a, and a couple others you know honestly lately i've used rx cleaning up that that's come in more handy to clean up something you know remove an accidental click or something here and there which has been great but I just enjoy outboard, and, and like I've said before, this all has to be fun. So you got to work the way that's fun, but you still have to get the job done. So far, I've been able to do it with the majority of it being outboard. Cleanup is a lot of the times uh, in the box, you know, surgical EQ, that sort of thing, removing because it just does it better, faster. You yeah. Know, See, easy. they ask you, do you feel with the Trident you use the computer more or less? less. <laughs> there you way go. less, actually, and. I've noticed since this went in, the 32 with and having 16 channels with the tra input transformers, that has even shifted uh, more of how I process going in on the recording side, where I've used actual less process outboard stuff. You know, where I might have stuck a compressor on, sometimes even just for color. You know, I'm not doing that like I was before. I'm getting that that a little bit of that color, a little bit of that mojo, that punch without having to add yet something else. So I've noticed that my sessions in the last two months have been even simpler on that end, which has been disappointing sometimes because it's fun to use everything. I know. And Aaron says, you know, the whole fact that you're moving a knob, it just gives you uh, immediate satisfaction and sometimes you're just quicker. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, that's a big part of it too. It's that, you know, it's the, I, I equate it to – buying the album and taking it and physically putting it on the record player and then playing it you know there's something that makes the whole experience more enjoyable at least for me you know sound i'm not going to argue there's plenty of stuff made all itb that sounds killer you know it's it has nothing to do with one i think being better than the other we all have our preferences and oh well, yeah sometimes digital has its uh, advantage over analog and vice versa yeah but by and large i do find the putting my hands on a physical, you know, fader or knob and just being able, you can close your eyes and kind of work it like an instrument sometimes and get what you want just yeah. to be, it's more satisfying. And you also now experience that 
having used waves you know for a long time you know ssl plugins all that stuff now that you actually got a waves 500 series not a waves 500 series, an actual ssl uh, 500 series. um uh, sorry a uh, 500 series yes yeah so yeah the ssl the the, the dynacomps it, it's and even that is still only one part of the circuit it's yeah. not the whole channel strip it's of course just not. the compressor circuit it's completely different and maybe the maybe their 500 is a little bit different i don't know how they manufacture it i've never even asked all i know is when i plug in one of those dynacon the edins it that it sounds like I remember when we would work on the one at MI, yeah. that punchy, like, instant, like, bam, it's right there, and it's coming at you, man. I've never got that from the plug-in, me personally. Maybe it's because I don't know how to use a plug-in. <laughs> could be. I'm not going to, you know, Where do that. I click? <laughs> but I also, I if I have to fiddle too much with something, that's yeah. a plug-in, sit there and mess with it, and then five minutes later I'm completely messing with it again, then five minutes later I'm completely messing with it yeah. again because it's not right. I'm turning it off and going to something else. Yeah. And I find that more uh, me doing with plugins. And that could completely come down to me not taking the time to get used to them and figuring out how to use it. And maybe that is exactly what it is. Well, and, yeah. and you know what? I just I get bored with it and I go back to something in the outboard and I start messing. And maybe, I, again, maybe it comes back to fun. I have more fun doing that. Yeah, yeah, I know. But it's user error, probably. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 for me, when I when I got the Apollo, the only reason I I, I did it was just because uh, I wanted a better converter, you know, better analog chain and all that stuff. And then just a couple of plugins from the from the simulation side of of their platform, the UAD platform, where the hardware, you know, like like the like the shadow. Shadow Hill stuff, which the hardware is ten thousand dollars, you know. So hey, if I can get that one for three hundred dollars, uh, I'll try it, you know. So stuff like that. But the the list of UAD is just so big, and uh, I don't have time to go through them. And then obviously they they cost money because you know they're good. But sometimes we just have so many options, it just it just turns you off. You're like, I'm not gonna go through these four hundred settings. That's a really good point. Uh, it's it's easy to go buy like big bundles of things and and how I'd be interested to know how many of you actually let's say you went out and bought the Waves Gold bundle yeah. have you actually taken the time to go through all of those and not just pull it up once and oh that's what it does but to actually learn what it does to know all those tools I don't know anybody that has there probably is somebody on this yeah. it definitely isn't me but I find when I have too many especially uh, if I buy a bunch of stuff at one time, I even used to do that with some hardware. We'd get like three or four things in at once and my next session would be completely fucked because I tried to use all of it all the time. <laughs> and it's just like, Oh, I didn't know what I was doing. And with plugins, it's the same. I found myself initially doing the same thing. I get all these and I feel like you start using them. And I like to get things now, one or two things at a time. And why am I getting it? Whether it's a plugin or whether it's a, uh, a piece of hardware what am I getting it for, you know, and get to know that thing and really use it and then go, okay, I'm missing something else here. Then occasionally want to come along and go, oh, that's cool, you know, and I, I got to just go pick that up because someone, uh, the, there's one called the, hold on, I'll tell you. Oh, Alex is asking, do you oh, have Wilkinson Audio D Bleeder? Yeah. That thing is great. I use that all the time. Do you have the Ultraviolet 500? Yes, it's right behind Ernesto. You probably can't see it. Here, scoot this way this way oh it's right there it's it's dark in here it's kind of hard to see yes absolutely it's on my master bus my mix bus permanently my mix bus is an alice smart c1 into the ssl ultraviolet into a pair of rupert neve tape emulators that go straight into an apogee rosetta that prints to a second computer that's always there i know and, and considering the rosetta right it's what is it almost 20 years old sounds amazing and, I love it. and it has a sound you know so we use that to print and that's what it is you just someone's and that's usually what what you end up deciding it's like what works you know this works i like the sound you stick with it and usually with hardware you can <laughs> stick with it longer because it doesn't get obsolete unless there is a software component that has to be there, you know, and then suddenly there's an update and then everything is out the window. So. Yeah. Miggy, uh, 
Crash Music says something I agree with. It all comes to what brings inspiration. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly it. Yep. You know, Whatever inspires you to create something is yeah. use it. I yeah. don't care what it is. And sometimes you try something because you heard of whoever recommending it. And then you try it. It's like, eh, eh, eh yeah. well, what I have works better for me. Yeah. And then sometimes and that's it. You get rid of it. Nothing wrong yep. with that. Another plugin I do use a lot, actually, that's not a logic one, is the Trident 9066 EQ. That thing is, it's made me want to go buy a hardware one, but they're not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and they're hard to find, actually. There's not that many of them out there. But that 9066 is, oh, my God, it's killer. It has really great filters, uh, low-cut and high-cut filters on it, which I use quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I know I've missed it. I've been trying to, as we were talking, I've been trying to see some, some people are saying some interesting stuff I wanted to point yeah, out. Yeah, you know, yeah, the difference between 500 series and and the rack gear is like, I haven't tested it, so. Well, there, fans. that's a, you know, I've seen that question brought up, like, is it really as good or not? And I got to say, yes, it's all different. I think some of the, the, the places where it's different is when you get into the, the power supply. You know, your rack gear, like you take a 5088 console or you take a Trident A range mm -hmm. or a lot of the Neves, and it's not running on, what is this? Is this it's 15, I think is what it is? Yeah. The console is 18, but you get the, the Neves they're and like, stuff, and they're running way yeah, they're hotter. Between 20 and 35 volts. Yeah. yeah, and that has an effect on the tone for sure. Yeah. So it's hard to say that a Neve 500 series mic pre would be exactly the same as its uh, no. rack mounted counterpart. No. But does that mean it's less cool or less good or less usable? Yeah. Hell no. no. Of course it can be good and usable and all those things. And and it's the same thing as running your signal through the whole SSL board and then hit the master bus instead of just the master bus on a rack. Right. Yeah, we're take I mean in some ways all this, you know, the way we're putting stuff together is like if you take, for the instance, this, the C1 into the ultraviolet into the Rupert Neves, that is a whole channel strip yeah. of, <laughs> it's like yeah. a Heinz 57, it's all completely yeah. different. One of the beauty, beautiful things about those SSLs, I mean, when you see Brower, I know he's gone mostly ITB now, but, but or, uh, you know, Chris, or any of those guys that are mixing on uh, Barisi, there, it's running through that whole channel strip, and that's all part of the sound. So we're not, you're not, did I just move your mic? Did I kick something? No. We're not going to get that full, it, it, it's unfair to expect the full effect of an SSL or a Neve or something when we're just buying pieces of the circuit. We can get part of that sound for sure, and you know what? It's killer, and it's fun, and it's usable, and all those things, but it isn't the same thing. No, of course you not. You know, and neither is a plug-in for that matter. But that does it just it's just different then. Yeah. That's all it is. It's just different. So yeah. use it, you know. And the one thing that if you want to get really geeky about this whole plug-in thing, the randomness that you have in analog is very hard to reproduce in digital because the plugging is just a snapshot of a particular analog moment. It's not hey, voltage goes up, goes down, fluctuations, blah 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 blah. The software cannot do that because the calculation would be enormous. Maybe well, at there, some point we'll no, get there. But there are, yeah. I don't know the, the, I can't remember the names of them off the top of my head. Someone here might know. But there are a couple companies that are getting into that now. But yeah. the processing power it takes exactly. is exactly. ridiculous. So you probably need the, the new Ultra M1, like four of them. And then maybe you can. I'd be cool with that. Uh, replicate the randomness of a board, you know? Because that's, that's. That's usually the appealing it, part. That's what I like about analog is the chaos yeah. of it. Yeah. But, you know, some styles of music, you won't want that. No. You know, I've had days where I come in and why is this, you know, side not as loud as the other one? I've yeah. had that with a couple of the outboard effects and I literally just have to like tap it. Okay, I need a new pot yeah. there probably or turn it on, turn it <laughs> top <Yeah>. back on. <laughs> I know. And um, the... Um, the engineer for Back in Black, you know, I always, always forget the British dude. I always f forget his name. When they were recording the Bahamas, you know, Back in Black, he would say, "It's like, man, we would start the session at 11, but I would come at 10 just to turn everything on and make sure everything was working because sometimes it happened, even though everything perfectly amazing gear, 
Sometimes it would not work because it worked the, the night before and then I turn it on. It's like, why is it not working? So even at that level, they have to check everything. Oh, yeah. Sean says here that the Waves F6 has become a, one of his favorites, but mm -hmm. he still finds himself reaching for a Tone Lux EQ while tracking. <laughs> and that is, you know, that's another way to look at it, too, is you use some good outboard while you're tracking and try to get as close as you can to the tone you're going for. And then, you know, your what you do in the box becomes a little simpler because maybe it's just clean up or massaging it to fit with other instruments, yeah. you know. But then that comes down to knowing what sound you're going yeah. for, you know. Yeah. Mutt Lang was the producer. Um, you know, he was more like the guy with the final say. Uh, the engineer was, was, was the British guy. So I forgot, I forgot his name. Um, but you can see him on YouTube. Yeah, recording with the Revs says he learned on plugins, but now trying outboard gear. It takes time to get used to it, but I love the sound of outboard preamps. Though, yeah, outboard preamps can have a huge effect on your sound, and you can use those even during mixing to run stuff back through. But I think that goes even with plugins, whatever you're getting. You have to take the time to learn whatever tools you have. I think a lot we get impatient now because so, so many things are instant. You can buy it and get it now, put it on, start using it, doing this that we don't take the time to really learn what it does, what it sounds like. Does it have its own sound? Does it affect the color? Is it just a compressor? Is it just an EQ? Beyond the EQ, does it have an effect on the tone, meaning the circuitry it's emulating, or if it's a real EQ? The, you know, I use my Comp 54s. I love those things from Golden Age. It's a $400 compressor that I absolutely love. And sometimes I don't even use the compressor circuit. I just run it through, and it has something in the mid-range that is just nice especially on guitars. Sometimes that's all I'm doing is using it for a little bit of extra color on that. And that can be the same thing with anything. You got to take the time to learn it, you know, but it's easy to always want the shiny new toys or whatever. But I also like outboard too, because it's, and now I'm trying to make uh, bigger decisions on the stuff I buy. So it's maybe a bit higher in piece of gear here and there for specific reasons. But you also, it's in a way, it's a bit of a, an investment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you're not going to get resale on your, your, your plugins, that's for sure. Yeah, it's Tony Platt. Tony Platt was the engineer on Back in Black. So Mutt Lang was just the guy who just said yes or no. But Tony Platt just did all the engineering. So oh, Hey, go back down again. I don't know why I keep reading your computer. I got a lot of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's another thing, you know, since you're talking about minus 6 dB or whatever, Today, when we got sounds, I always look for, you know, I don't want Logic to record harder than whatever. And, and I think we're going, where is it? What line are we hitting? Minus. What is it? Minus, minus 12? Or what are we Here's hitting? Here's the thing. Recording, it, it, I, I, Meg, I'm assuming you're talking about recording levels going into your converter, into the computer, whatever your DAW is. There's really absolutely zero reason to record up anywhere close to zero, minus one. I even try, I try to shoot for like minus 12 in that area for a couple reasons. One, it's all going to have to come down when mixing anyway, because once you get a bunch of tracks on it, there's only so much room in the funnel to get down there. So you're going to be doing that stuff anyway. So I try to track with that in mind, especially if I know I'm mixing and doing the whole thing through. That also leaves room for uh peaks you know if i if i i'm relatively at minus 12 right and all of a sudden the drummer is like ah, or the bass player is like bam you know and we're at minus four mm -hmm. for that thing i didn't clip i didn't lose anything yeah. i don't have to worry about inter sample peaking which can be a problem uh and then i've got to lower it or i've got to go do gaining you know that sort of thing so there's really you don't gain anything in digital by recording at minus one no you know, and I know there's that argument to be said that you're losing bits and all that. No. I, one of these days when I'm bored, I'm going to do something where I recorded really low, like minus 18 and then like minus three or two. Yeah. And I'm going to level them out. And then I want someone to tell me that they can hear the bit loss. Yeah. Because I don't know anybody that can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be some, but my ears can't. And his ears are really good. And we've done somewhat tests like this, yeah. not quite that scientific. And it's been like, man, we're listening to the grass grow right now. You know, it's just yeah. not that. But there's no reason to record that loud. You don't get any benefit. Let's yeah. put it that way. If we were back at, you know, 16-bit or real early when you were 8-bit, yeah, you had to because the noise floor was higher. But if you're recording 24-bit, 
anything 24 bit 44 48 96 whatever as long as it's 24 bit you don't have to worry about noise so there's no reason to uh, to take it that hot and yeah. run the risk of ruining the waveform and the, uh, the files that I get from people that I have to mix that stuff happens all the time yep. and it's just there's all of a sudden there's this distort you can see it in the waveform it's just bloop, bricked yeah. off and you hear yeah uh, one one, you know. one big sausage yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're like, hey, man, can you fix that distortion? Yeah. Sometimes I've been able to RX some of it out. And sometimes, nope, I can't yeah. do because the transient's just yeah. completely screwed. So. Sure. 24 bits is 144 dB of dynamic range, right? So 144 dB is basically when you sit behind a jet engine and listen to it. That's 144 dB. So. Or when you listen to me yell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and when... And when people say, oh, no, you have to record at 32-bit now because it's great. 32-bit is a thousand, over a thousand dB of dynamic range. So you don't ever going to ever, ever need that, you know? So what's the point? Wade says somebody over on Gearspace will tell you they can hear it. Yeah, of course. They, all, <laughs> of they course always they will. will. All, the, all the best ears are over there. And, you know, I'm going to say this. Who cares? Exactly. If I record at minus 18 and it is only 20 bits... And you record at minus yeah. one, and it's 24 bits. I guarantee you, when the mix is done, you ain't no, you're not gonna notice. Yeah, exactly. And we still listen to the Beatles stuff, you know. So, which was done on a freaking four track drums on one side, you know. So, hey, no 24 yeah. bit there. So, oh yeah, you know, it's like they they had um, frequency loss because of all the bouncing. Well, the high tech four track stuff yeah. we're doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> So we know what these guys, obviously, you know, the EMI hardware is a little bit better than a, than a Porta Studio, but, but, uh, but still, you know, you have to, this uh, thing, you get, no one has even mentioned they've seen this thing sitting over here yet. <laughs> Alex, the WA76 comp, we actually have two of them here. I've had both of them modded by Revive Audio and they are usable to me now. <laughs> Alex, I need a thousand dB of headroom when I decide to blow up Earth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could probably get some inline pads made to help that. You know, we get the right resistors in there. We can pad that down. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, Marco says I prefer to lose bits than my job. Exactly. Yeah, the first time you you've ruined a, a recording because you recorded too hot and it's not fixable, and the client paid you to do it, and they're going to try to mix. Yeah, they're not coming back to you. Yeah. So. I know. These are things, though, that, you know, I, I think if we're just paying attention to levels and stuff, they, these are non-issues, really. No. But they're easy to talk about. They're easy to get into arguments about on Gearspace. All of this stuff. They, there's a thousand YouTube videos about them, oh, yeah. you know, everything being perfect, perfect, perfect. And, yeah. you know, just pay attention. Don't record too hot into digital. Make sure you like the sound of it. Who cares if it's 24-bit, 21-bit, 19-bit, yeah. as long as it sounds good? Uh, yeah. Make some freaking music, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. In the end, it's still the, the, the song, so don't don't blame the tools. But here, I, I want to qu just quantify why I had the WA-76s modded. And let's watch our time because we still have a lot to set up for. Uh, yep. You know, the, the rest of the group shows up at 6, and he and I still have to be videographers. we got to yeah. set up all the location audio because our setup is morphing into something easier, and it's a lot. The When we got the warms, the, the 76s, it's not that they were necessarily bad, but the thing I didn't like about them is they were inherently crunchy. There was, no matter what you were doing, there was always a tad bit of a distortion to it. Even if you weren't compressing, even if like the needle was just like, moving so much that you didn't even know if it was moving. You were just using them for uh, color, like on toms or something, just to add something to it on your front end before you print it into your DAW. But I noticed that once the compression would start at all, there was always a bit of, of a crunchy thing. And I'm like, man, I don't, if I'm just trying to, to tickle or if I'm doing two or three dB of reduction, I'm not looking for crunch yet. Right. You know, I, I wanted something that was more usable. And to me, a regular 1176 wallet, you know, a regular 1176, a UA, <laughs> <laughs> let's get it right. Waymire. Uh, you could, they, they did have a sound to them and you could drive them into some really nice harmonic distortion and do some cool stuff with them. But if you tickled it, it didn't automatically sound crunchy or at least most didn't. They were all a little bit different. 
And that was both WAs did that. And I was like, man, I found myself not using them because of that. I mean, in places I wanted to, I'm like, man, I just don't want that right away there. If I want that, I want to push it into that. You know, I wanted to have that option. So we decided, you know, I, I had the one of the ART Pro VLA and an old EQ that I don't have anymore in Orban modded by them, and they did a really nice job. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to send one. We said, we'll yeah. send one. We'll see what happens. We got nothing to lose, really, right? And it came back, and all of a sudden, and we actually, I had the input uh, pot changed to uh, one that's, I think, the same one or similar to what's actually in there, the, the UA. And out of the gates, I could do a couple dB of compression, and it was doing the thing. It still had the sound. It didn't fundamentally change the sound of it, but it wasn't crunchy. Like, yes, now I got this on a vocal. I got this on a tom. Mm -hmm. I already had a nice mic and EQ I liked. I didn't want the crunch. Bam, there it is. But I could drive it, and I could build into that crunchy kind of thing. Now it's it's something that I want to use. So we sent the second one and had it modded by Revive as well, and they did a great job. Both of them, we used them actually a ton. I used it yesterday on uh, Verdine's bass, man. Got Earth, Wind, Fire in here, into the Trident, with a little Revive modded WA-76. We were done. Yeah. Well, that that guy's an awesome freaking bass player. <laughs> now I'm gonna record to a Porta Studio without Dolby because I'm evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you don't uh, the the Dolby on the the X28. Unfortunately, just took away your high end that was already limited. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, especially if you're already used to digital because it's so clean, man, you go back to, to let's say, conventional consumer tape, you go like, oh, man. Because uh, we actually measured, we didn't measure, what am I saying? The, on the manual, it says the, the X28 went up to 12K. 12K. That was the frequency range of, of, that, uh, of that head, right? Uh, and the, the newer one, the 280, 14k baby 2k and, more and then the and then the this f8 one, is 18 18k so we're going and up eight tracks we're going up we're gonna reach 20k eventually yeah we have a <laughs> lot of these videos with these different things coming up we're just trying to get everything shot while it's been busy at the studio so we're trying to get as much as and i'm paying attention to a lot of these things that you guys are saying because i want to add this stuff in there you know because there's some really good ideas Let's see, Aaron. Uh, the Audioscape stuff, I definitely, that's on my list. I have a Hairball Audio Blue Stripe. Love it. Absolutely love it. Yep. Mickey, well, thank you. Really appreciate that. Trying to see what we've missed. Let's see. Uh, uh, Sean, full disclosure, I didn't actually build my, my Blue Stripe. The friend of mine did, and I bought it from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Revive does great work. They've also they've been really cool, uh, really cool. You know, I would continue to send stuff to them if I need some work done. Actually, let's see. Did we miss anything else? All right. Well, I guess it's it's time to to call it right because we gotta continue setting up yeah i don't even get to go to chipotle today you know, man. i mean you guys are are amazing conversation uh, holders you know so but we we gotta we gotta call it because we gotta set up everything in the next two hours so yeah, that, yeah. and the only thing we have set up so far is Just drums we're drums. A little tweaking there yeah but we have to set up cameras so we can video all the recording process and get wired up get everybody wired up yeah. for uh sound yeah um the fe no aaron i haven't got to compare the day king fet 2 to the fet 3 i love the fet 3 though oh my god i love that thing yeah but chipotle w when when you have delivered they don't fill it up yeah man it's always not quite right and it's expensive now it almost double. It gets close to doubling yeah. the cost. Uh, it's it's worth it to go to Chipotle. Like, can you fill it up a little more? You know, so especially me because I go there every day. Yeah. So you know, I maybe get portions. They, they that skimp most on rice. <laughs> you know, they skimp on rice. It's like I'll give you a little. Well, listen, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. A lot of good uh, ideas with some microphones and other things. I'm gonna add all that into the queue for the parameters that we do on uh, a lot of this stuff coming up. Like I said, I'm working on. 
another series that's going to be a bit more experimental on the recording side for fun. It's still going to, we're going to create music with it, but we're going to do a completely different order. I'm going to add some of these ideas that work for that into there too. So we can just try to, you know, it's just, this all just one giant experiment, man. Just going to have fun making music and see what the hell happens. Get the bowl and ask for a tortilla on the side. I just like the bowl, man. Yeah. Just give me a good old fashioned chicken bowl. Some chicken, obviously. Tons of cheese, hot sauce, side of chips that I use as my spoon. <laughs> Game over. Now I'm hungry, man. Ah. Yeah, we well, we go set up. Yeah, we still gotta write, write, finish writing the song. So, <laughs> I haven't even made a chart yet. So, uh, of the, what we did write. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate it. Head to the, if you're on Facebook still, we still have the, the the group over there that we're trying to. You know, be more active on. I'm trying to uh, get back to comments and stuff on YouTube a little bit faster. I know I'm about five or six days behind right now, but I'll get to that. I'm even trying to get the community part of the YouTube thing going just so we can keep chatting in between all these things, man, because I just want to hear what everybody's doing and keep taking ideas and, um, you know, we'll keep putting out videos that hopefully are interesting. So who, who charted? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Thank you. Have a good one. We'll see you later.